Okay, further back in the center there. Um, speaking from the left, I want to uh, just suggest a slightly different take on all of this. Sure. I think that when you said that what's at stake here is everything, you actually gave a very narrow definition of everything, because you only talked about science and technology. That's, that's true. I, I agree. And, and I, I'll I think take what's that. at stake here, and many people on the left think that what's at stake here is literally everything. It's, it's, uh, it's not just uh, um, theocratic science, but it's theocracy in government. It's, um, it's many issues that are defined as moral issues by this or that, you know, different uh, religious uh, group. And it's being pushed by the most um, restrictive religious perspective and not the, mo not the broadest religious perspective about what morality and what ethics is and what politics is and what democracy is and what the political structure should be. So I think it really is about everything in a much broader sense. And, and I'll just finish by saying that you asked about theocratic science. I've seen theocratic science. I had, when I was um, teaching at Rutgers, I had a student who was from Pakistan. And she was providing me, she provided me a lot of articles about, in English, about uh, Muslim science and how the goal of Muslim science should be to, um, they actually didn't talk so much about God, but they talked about principles of good and bad that were, that could be discovered and, and dealt with. And they were talking about good and evil as the subject matter of science. No, I, I think that's a, that's a worthwhile point. Um, the, uh, um, it's interesting that you brought up Muslim science. Um, about three or four years ago, I started, because I have a lot of, I have a little web page with a lot of evolution stuff up on it. I started to get emails from Turkey and Lebanon and even a couple from Iran, believe it or not, of students who wanted me to answer their questions about evolution. And I, a few of them I asked, why are you asking me this? And they connected me with the writings uh, that go under the pen name of Harun Yaha, who is an Islamic writer based in Turkey, who has written a whole series of anti-evolution books. And one of the students was actually kind enough to buy me an English translation of the book and mail it to me from Turkey so that I could see what all this was about. And it astonished me. Two parts about it were, one was, I suppose, not so astonishing, and one was downright hilarious. The uh, not so astonishing parts is that all of the arguments made in the Islamic world for the scientific insufficiencies of evolution are just recycled versions of the ones that I've talked to you about here. So there's nothing new. But the second part was genuinely amusing. And that is, Haran Yaha argued to his young readers that they should appreciate the fact that evolution is a Western Christian plot to subvert the morals <laughs> of Islamic youth. And as part, as part of his proof of this, he pointed out that Charles Darwin studied for the priesthood of the Church of England. And that proves to you that he's just another crusader, um, which I thought was a, a rather interesting, interesting take. But, but the other thing, you know, the other thing that's worth pointing out, and I think that we can learn a lot from the history of the Islamic world. And if you go back to the 13th or 14th century, and you look at the great Muslim caliphate across the Near East and North Africa, that was the center of learning and science and cosmopolitan thought. The Islamic world was the leader in mathematics and astronomy and in many other branches of science. Something happened to the Islamic world to the point where the amount of genuinely important science done in the Islamic world in the 20th century is unfortunately is very close to zero. And that something is exactly the ascendancy of the kind of theocratic talk that, you're, that, that you are talking about. And if this were to happen in the leading nation in the West, we could see the same sort of retreat backwards. And that worries me a great deal. Um, I just want to comment on, on this. Uh, a lot of folks on the left claim to be supportive of science. But as we saw with the uh, various uh, debates at the school board here in Ohio, our strongest support has come from traditional Republicans, traditional conservatives. The Democrats have been very, very weak in their support and sometimes have uh, also opposed the uh, science curriculum. Yeah, and I should, I should also point out, I mean, I showed a cartoon at the beginning to sort of point this out. Um, I wrote an op-ed piece right after the trial that was published in the Philadelphia Inquirer. And in the first part of it, I said, if there was ever a place where the proponents of intelligent design had a home field advantage, it was in the federal court in Harrisburg. They had a popularly elected school board that was behind them. They had a citizenry that was behind them. They had a federal judge recommended for the bench by Rick Santorum, who in his three years on the bench had established himself 
as a conservative jurist and a self-described strict constructionist, everything should have gone their way. And in fact, the attorneys on our side of the case looked at this guy's record when we drew him, and they said, boy, let's just hope he's smart. Well, as it turns out, um, he was. And he paid attention to the arguments, um, and he wrote a very powerful decision that I would recommend to anyone. And it's particularly powerful because it came from a conservative jurist. And that's a valuable point to make. Uh, way in the back. <coughs> I want to add to that gentleman's point before um, you had mentioned about the Middle East. And my question is, what happened? I mean, what happened here back in the 50s, 60s, 70s? You know, science did everything. Everybody generally was seemed to be pretty interested. We put a man on the moon and atomic energy, everything else. Um, you know, was this always an underlying theme throughout the United States, or is it right now? Or why is it right now in the last decade or two decades kind of rearing its ugly head now? Well, my, my short answer to that is that there has always been an active anti-evolution movement in the United States. Um, it has uh, ebbed and flowed in terms of the degree to which it has caught the public imagination. But if you look at opinion polls in which you ask people whether they accept the evolutionary theory of human origins, and you go back in these polls to the 40s and 50s, you find quite consistently, depending on how you phrase the question, that only about 35 to 45 percent of the people in this country accept evolution. That was true even back in those good old days of the 50s and 60s that you're talking about. Um, in the summer of 1964, I was a guide, to say more about my youth than you ever wanted to know, I was a guide at the Boy Scout Pavilion of the New York World's Fair. So I spent a whole summer at the World's Fair working a few hours a day in the Boy Scout Pavilion, my little shorts and neckerchief and everything else, and the rest of the time going around the fair, having just a wonderful time. There was an exhibit at that World's Fair, the New York World's Fair, uh, put up by the Moody Institute of Science. Because I was already a science geek at the time, I saw Institute of Science, cool, went in. It was an anti-evolution exhibit. Um, so this sort of organized anti-evolution activity has been with us for a long time. I think what is, when you say what's happening now, two things. I think one is that the political climate in the United States has made it much easier for people to take religious ideas into the mainstream and to run with them, to argue essentially that, you know, if science has an anti-religious bias, we have to correct it with a pro-religious bias. Um, and then the second thing is I think that the Edwards versus Aguilard decision in 1987 was a shockwave for the creationist. And you saw that dramatic change in terms of the adoption of this new idea. That the new label apply, and that's all it is, it's a label, applied to the creation science movement, intelligent design, brilliant PR. If you were working at an ad agency and you were brainstorming for a product name, man, when you came up for that, with that name, you should get a raise. Um, and I think, in part, because it's a, a phrase that appeals to all people of faith. If you're a person of faith, I think by definition, you think that there is an intelligence, there's a, a guiding force to the universe, that, that your life has meaning and purpose and value. And then when you hear the word intelligent design, you figure, wow, that sounds like that's something that I should be on the side of. So I think it's a combination of constant anti-evolution sentiment and brilliant public relations on the part of the intelligent design movement. And I, I, let me just uh, add to that. I think that that's one thing that, that has really helped strengthen this movement is the ambiguity of the phrase intelligent design. That on one hand, it can mean we believe that there's a God who created the universe, and a lot of people believe that. And uh, the other meaning, however, is the idea that this concept of an intelligent creator ought to be made part of science, which is a very different thing. Next question. Do we have any over here? We have one. Uh, right on the aisles. Okay, fine. 